it's just in its own window, so um, a little bit different. Ah, recording is starting. Um, so what I wanted, what we felt would, was really important as a part of the Summer Institute uh, was to take some time to talk seriously about um, what are the ethical obligations that we have when we are operating in these spaces? What are the things that we should be thinking about? And how do we move forward with the kinds of ethical actions and um, responses that I think are at the top of many people's minds? Uh, in my experience, people very rarely set out to do unethical things uh, typically, it happens because of the constraints and situations in which we find ourselves. So I think it's useful to step back and try to understand what the ethical obligations are that we face when we are operating in this space. Okay. Uh, next slide. So the first thing we need to think about is simply the question, or maybe not so simply the question, of what is ethics? So one of the things that I find is that this is actually a harder question to answer than many people uh, realize. Um, for many people, next slide, ethics is simply the regulations and rules. So if you, you can think of this as the legal compliance theory of ethics, ethics as an effort to be to um, constrain by providing the rules that we must satisfy in order to act ethically in the world. So that could be as simple as being truthful in disclosures, uh, if we're thinking about you know, sort of accounting ethics. Um, but the problem, next slide, is that this actually is not the right way to think about it. There are many things that are legal, but which are not ethical to do, and many things that are ethical, but are not actually legal to do. Uh, the easiest way to think about this, or the most obvious way to think about this, is in terms of what are sometimes referred to as ethical dilemmas or moral dilemmas. Now, we'll talk more about those in a moment, um, but the idea of a moral dilemma is where you have two deeply held principles, in many cases one of them is to follow the law, uh, but that cannot all be mutually satisfied. It may be that, for example, in order to uh, drive in a safe manner, you need to temporarily break the law because other people around you are driving unsafely or because something deteriorated with the conditions. Similarly, um, in ethical situations, in ethical decision-making, we sometimes are forced to confront the challenge of uh, whether we follow the rules as they are laid out in compliance or follow a different ethical principle. Now, I wanna be clear, I am not here in any way endorsing that people do unethical, uh, sorry, do illegal things and then say, oh, but Professor Banks said that it was ethical, so it's okay for me to do an illegal thing. That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is if we want to think about our ethical obligations, we need to go beyond simply thinking about regulations, rules, and compliance. Now, next slide. A different sort of theory of ethics is ethics is the ethicist as, um, as traffic police, as, as the police officer who comes in and says, no, no, you cannot do that. Uh, no, you can't uh, do you. You can't deploy this technology that you really want to. No, you can't post that content or remove that content. And again, next slide. This is an overly restricted view because ethics is not purely about negative constraints. It's not just about what we cannot do. It's about something much more than that. It does have a positive element in terms of the rights and responsibilities and obligations that we affirmatively have, not simply the things that we are prohibited from doing. So if the, the rules, regulations, compliance, legal picture is not the right way to think about ethics, and if the police officer negative constraint is not the right way to think about it, what is the right way? Next slide, twice. Um, the right way to think about ethics, I want to suggest to you, is in terms of trying to answer two different questions. The first is the question of what should we value? The second, next slide, is the question of given what we do in fact value, how should we act? So now notice the word should appears in both of these. Ethics is what in philosophy we would refer to as an area of normative inquiry which is to say we are concerned with what ought 
to be the case, what we should value, how we should act, not just descriptively how people happen to act. So the fact that people, that many people act in a certain way, of course, does not make it right. It's a lesson that many people uh, learn when they're much younger than, than we all are right now. But the idea is that we should not simply look at what is actually the case or what people's behaviors actually look like, but rather think about what they should look like, what we should have as our core values. Now, how could we potentially answer questions like these? So next slide. Um, when we think about what we should value, we need to recognize that our values are influenced by our cognition, our culture, our history, the things that make us who we are. Part of what makes me who I am is, and to a certain extent, the things that I ought to value, uh, that I have ties and binding commitments to my daughter, and so therefore I ought to value, and in fact do value, uh, her health and success. I am a member of the Carnegie Mellon community, and so I ought to and do value the success of that community. I am here standing as a teacher, so I ought to and do value the learning that is hopefully going to occur over the remaining time of this session. Okay. Now, notice in all of those, the history matters, the culture matters. It happens to be the case that we have institutions like Carnegie Mellon, that in the a learning context, such as this Summer Institute, there's an expectation and an obligation for the teacher to provide information and hopefully at least a little bit of insight to everybody. It could have been different. So in that sense, there is a kind of cultural relativity to values, but there also are some deep normative, that is to say about the ought and should, prescriptions about the things we ought to value. There's a, 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 a famous saying in philosophy that, um, that it might be rational for someone to prefer essentially not having a hangnail, uh, even if that should mean the end of the entire world, that it's okay to value whatever you happen to value. And I wanna push back against that. I think that we have a lot of reasons to push back against that, that there, while there are going to be individual, cultural, historical, specific differences in what we value, there also are constraints and guidances. We are not in the world of sort of pure relativism where any set of values is acceptable. Now, interestingly, I think a lot of the work in ethics and much of the work of ethics that is relevant here today is actually about the second question. So next slide. If we think about given what we value, how we should act, what that really is asking is for guidance to use a somewhat technical language. It's asking for a decision procedure. There's a set of values. The values, some of them are about me personally, some of them are about me as a member of a community or with a broader set of connections. How should we act? So if you've ever heard of terms like deontology or virtue ethics or consequentialism or utilitarianism or egoism, what those theory, normative ethical frameworks are is in a kind of a little bit of a simplification, but not much. What they are is they are decision procedures. So if I am a consequentialist, what that means is that given my values, I'm going to use this particular decision procedure to decide how I should act. Now, one of the things that is very nice about these decision procedures is, of course, that they are concrete, they are usable, they can be provided to people to provide them with guidance. And we can therefore look to ask the question, when do they agree and when do they differ? Because what often happens in the discussions and debates about ethical decision-making in public life, including in the context of, say, disinformation, extremism, and hate speech online, is that people will become fixated on, should we be a deontologist or should we be a utilitarian? And the answer is that in the vast majority of the cases that uh, we will talk about here, and in the vast majority of cases that arise, it turns out it doesn't actually matter. It turns out that essentially all of these different theories agree. And to use a, a more prosaic example, we might think about, um, given my values, should I knock somebody over on the street and take their wallet and run away? Well, it doesn't actually matter which of the normative ethical frameworks I 
I endorse. They all agree that I ought not act in that way, that that is something I should not do. So we don't actually have to make the decision. So I don't, I don't by this want to suggest that there isn't, that there are no good or interesting questions about which normative ethical framework is the right one. But I do want to be clear that I'm not going to be giving you an answer here today. I'm not going to tell you, oh, you really ought to be a utilitarian. Regardless of what my own views are about which of the normative ethical frameworks is best, the reality is that for the kinds of cases that we're going to be concerned with here and that we have been, and that have been coming up throughout the Institute and that are, of course, present in the world today, um, it turns out we can be agnostic about them. That to answer this question, we don't necessarily need to answer the additional question of which normative ethical framework is the right one. Instead, we can focus on the details of the case. Now, what are the details and what are the cases that are particularly interesting? Next slide. Well, what we're going to be primarily worried about in a certain sense are what I earlier described as moral dilemmas. That is, these situations in which two of our core values conflict. So I have a core value for following the law. I have a core value for um, arriving on time for a meeting. That's not really one of my core values, but let's imagine that it is. Um, I can easily find myself in a situation in which those core values conflict. Or perhaps I have limited financial resources and I have a value of caring for my, my uh, partner. I have a value for caring for my child. And I may simply not be able to satisfy both of those simultaneously. Now, those are what we in philosophy refer to as moral dilemmas. These are these situations in which two core values conflict. And so we need to resolve this conflict. And we need to figure out what it is that we should do pursuant to that second question that's up there. Now, in order to, to think about this, I, it's sometimes it's tempting to jump to incredibly rare, weird cases, um, things like what are tr called trolley problems. If you've heard about those, those have been in the news a lot over the last few years because of self-driving cars. Um, but in fact, next slide, moral dilemmas are a lot more common than we realize. They aren't necessarily about strange and obscure cases. They rather are the inevitable consequence of the fact that we all value many different things and we live in a complex world where we can't get everything that we want. And so instead we need to recognize that many times we are going to have to trade off one value against another. Or we're going to need to think about which of our core values is more important than another one. And we need to recognize that this is not because of strange cases, but it's because of the but it's because of the kind of almost ubiquity of moral dilemmas. So I value freedom of speech. I value security and autonomy. Almost everything that happens online, certainly many, many things around uh, disinformation, many things around extremism are going to put those values in tension with one another. We're going to have to prioritize one over another. And so we need to think about what it means to make these kinds of decisions in a moral dilemma. Next slide. Now, one of the things that is important to recognize about moral dilemmas is um, that while they are difficult in many ways, they are challenging to work through and they are complicated in many real world cases. They also, uh, in a certain sense, provide us with a certain kind of opportunity. What do I mean by that? Well, um, next slide, actually, let's go uh, three, um, is that there really, we need to recognize that there are sort of three different categories that actions can fall into when we're thinking about ethical obligations and ethical opportunities. They could be morally required, which is to say there is only one thing that you ought to do at this moment. Given your values, there is one action you should do. And so you should pursue that one. It's morally obligatory. Jumping down to the bottom, it could be that it's morally forbidden. It could be that you find yourself in a situation where, in fact, there is nothing that is ethically permissible. Now, just to be clear, people are capable of doing many things that are not morally permissible, uh, that are you know, perhaps even morally forbidden. It may be that you look and say, well, I have to do something because I've been put in this horrible position. Nothing I do is ethically good. Anything I do is going to leave an ethical mark, as it were. And yet, nonetheless, we might be stuck in that position because of the way the world is structured. 
The most interesting case, though, is the middle one, which is that something might be morally permissible. And in particular, next slide, there might be multiple morally permissible actions. So in many of the cases of moral dilemmas, in many of the cases with the trade-offs, or where we have to prioritize one value over another, we are not actually in a situation where there's exactly one unique required answer or one required action. And it is, in fact, a mistake if we set ourselves the goal of always knowing exactly what the morally perfect action is. So takeaway number one from today is to rethink what your expectations are for your ethical obligations and what ethics can do in guiding your actions. In many cases, what ethics does is it says, here are the set of permissible things, but within that set, you can use other considerations. Something might be easier to do rather than, you know, one action might be easier for you. And as long as both are morally permissible, you should not feel bad about, you know, doing the one that's easier to do. The problem becomes, of course, when you do the thing that is easier precisely uh, because it is easier, even though it is morally forbidden. Okay. So we need to be very careful not to expect that there will be one action that is always the one true answer. Ethics is more complicated than that and frequently leads to us recognizing a set of actions. And we're going to see this when we start to dive into a case study later here in the, in the uh, presentation. Next slide. So now let's let's think about this. All right. So we, we, we have this sort of high level abstract thoughts about ethics. Um, we're focused here in the Summer Institute in many ways on the online setting. So we're thinking here about ethics and technology. And I think, you know, sometimes there is a view that, in fact, um, ethics is uh, not relevant in technology. This view seems to be fading, uh, thankfully. But I think for many people, there's long been a view that, in fact, um, technology is value neutral. Technology is like a hammer. There's nothing ethical about technology. What matters is what people do with it, what uses they put to it. So there's nothing ethical or not about uh, deep fake technology or about bots that amplify in, in a social network what matters is simply how we use the technologies. And I think we see something like this if we look at, say, some recent headlines. So next slide. And this has animations, so don't be surprised, Jennifer. Um, if we look at recent headlines, what we see over and over is the ways that people talk about technology as a tool or as an a, a, a thing that is used poorly, but which is not itself the object of our ethical evaluation. So this is, I think, a pretty common view. And what I want to do is take a few minutes here to push back very firmly against that view and to suggest that, in fact, um, ethical decisions and ethical issues arise throughout the space of things that we're looking at, um, even when we're just thinking about what are seemingly technological questions. So let's see some examples of this. Next slide, twice. Um, so let's think about content online. Let's suppose it's on a social media platform, which is a pretty common place for online content to find itself these days. Um, so what content is promoted? Which accounts are removed from a social media platform? These are questions, uh, especially that first one, which content is promoted, that might look like a very technological question. You know, what is the actual algorithm that is used to promote, excuse me, or demote or remove certain or create even create certain kinds of content on the platform. And we might think, look, that's that's that particular algorithm. That's not an ethical thing. Right? We can program it in many different ways. What matters is how it gets used in practice in this particular social media platform. And what I want to suggest is that's actually not the right way to think about it, because exactly because there are many different technological ways to create a content promotion or demotion or removal algorithm. It is, in fact, not a technological decision to pick one rather than another. 
Rather, it is an ethical decision. It is an ethical decision about which values will be promoted, which values will be advanced via this technology. So what this is in some ways is the kind of technology or social media platform um, analog to the idea that, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, I earlier said, you know, that technology, maybe it's like a hammer. A hammer isn't ethical or not. It's, its uses are. Well, that's actually not right. Because what a hammer does is it, in this that case, physically implements the value that it's important to be able to pound in things like nails. Now, that might seem really sort of trivial and, you know, sort of funny. I mean, I don't know. Some of you may even be laughing at that. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that it's not a minor point to say that all technology implements certain kinds of values. And we could see this if we, uh, next slide, consider a different stakeholder when we're thinking about um, extremism, hate speech, disinformation online. And that is the person who creates the social media. And we can ask the question, what kinds of content can I even create? What tools do I have at my disposal? Well, those tools embody, in a certain sense, implement the ethical choice that this kind of content is at least sometimes morally permissible to create. And in fact, that it's probably morally permissible in any of the contexts where the technology is usable. Now, it's not going to be universal, but it is important to see that the decision to say, ah, here's a problem I want to solve with technology. Here's a kind of content that I want to give people the tools to create is itself an ethical choice because it is implementing or realizing or advancing certain values, namely the values that this is a kind of content worth creating at least some of the time. Or if we think about, um, next slide, uh, if we think about what kinds of content should receive extra regulatory oversight, that is again, a sort of technological question, because most of the time the oversight is, is handled in technologically assisted or mediated ways. But it is, of course, you know, that one I think is sort of obviously an ethical question, right? Which, whose voices am I going to check to make sure that they are not unethically, perhaps even illegally spreading extremism, disinformation, and hate? Or, next slide, thinking just more generally about tech development. What problems, as I said, are worth solving? I mean, I could develop a system that counts the number of penguins in Antarctica by looking at satellite imagery. And for me to invest my time to create that system is to say that is something worth doing. But to say it is worth doing is to say that it advances, in some sense, our values or my values. It is to say it falls into the scope of that second question that I gave you of how to think about ethics. Falls into the scope of, given my values, what should I do? Is it building this kind of app to count penguins? Or is it creating something that can automatically curate certain content for me on top of a social media platform? That kind of decision, the tools that we create, the problems that we solve with technology, is itself an ethical choice. Or if we think about you know, the next two slides um, here, go ahead and get them both up, um, we can think about officers of an organization, uh, the chief technology officer. What are we going to do to revise our system? When are we going to say, hey, something went wrong here and we need to fix this? Or if we think about being the CEO, how should we fund our platform or service? Now that might seem like, well, that's obviously not a technological question, but of course it is. Because by the technological choices that I make, I can alter the amount of funding or the type of funding that is available or required. So in fact, when we think about all of the ways in which ethical questions arise within technology, in particular within the kinds of technology that are relevant for the topic of the Summer Institute, we can quickly see that these are all deeply ethical questions. Next slide. And of course, the list could go on and on. Um, I picked out six stakeholders. I could have picked out many, many more. 
Right? So the point is, if we think about, next slide, uh, twice, um, that there really are two morals that we want to take away from this. Okay? The first is that ethical issues are It's not something that, you know, ethics is not something that shows up at the very end. These, these issues, these somethings, um, are not the thing you do after you've built the technology. You don't get to, much as people might think this way, build technology or create content and only then think to yourself, well, you know, is that an ethical thing to do? The ethical obligations, the ethical opportunities, the ethical uh, decisions start so much earlier. And in particular, what this then connects with is this overall idea, next slide, that technology is not value neutral. Technology is not, and in fact, technology, including hammers, is not value neutral. Okay. It implements or realizes or makes possible certain kinds of core values. And uh, next two slides, um, social security is no, social cybersecurity is not an exception to this claim about technology. So there are the kind of obvious moral questions that arise when we're thinking about disinformation, hate speech, extremism online. I've already flagged what I think is the most obvious one, freedom of speech versus security and autonomy. But it's not just about that. It's about more simply what kinds of communities are made possible through the creation of these technologies. Because of course we could, eliminate online extremism simply by having incredibly narrow communities, namely community, or maybe not ex eliminate extremism, um, but we could uh, dramatically reduce, I'll say it that way, uh, hate speech online if people were not allowed to communicate online. Now, we might say, well, that's just ridiculous. Of course, people are gonna communicate online, but that is a choice. The choice to allow people to have connections with those that they do not know and do not necessarily approve of. The, the, ability to post content that can be viewed by many people. The, the fact that there are not, in many cases, controls on the kinds of content that is put in front of somebody, those are all ethical choices. And they're not ethical choices about freedom of speech versus security. They're about other kinds of values that come into tension with one another. That in fact, we have these trade-offs between values almost everywhere in the space of social cybersecurity. We are constantly having to balance and judge the ways in which the different values that we have come into conflict and some are advanced and some are not. So next slide. Let me um, actually dive down a little bit more on this particular point uh, about um, these two morals. And really, I realize this may seem a bit like overkill, um, but I think it's important uh, to really understand that our ethical obligations are not restricted to, well, should we remove this particular piece of content? Because I think when we look at the online space, it is very natural and very tempting to have an incredibly narrow scope for ethics. That ethics is that thing that happens only at the end. It's that thing that happens only about things like content removal. And if you take away a second moral from today, it is the ubiquity of values and ethical decisions throughout technology, including the technology that both uh, creates, supports, promulgates, disseminates all of these pernicious, harmful kinds of speech in online settings. So next slide, let's, let's dig down in this just a little bit more. So, um, I think when we think about technology, and especially when we think about uh, technology in these kinds of spaces, it's very tempting to think about uh, just the development step, right? the, the part where you're actually, you know, let, let's face it, oftentimes the cool part, right? You're building the actual technology or you're building the actual content that you're going to push out into the world. But it's important to recognize that this is only one piece of a much larger pu uh, puzzle when we think about the ways in which technology is created and the ethical issues that arise throughout this. So um, if we go, we can sort of think about a kind of caricature. Um, so Jennifer, I think this is gonna be about seven advances. Um, we can sort of caricature a kind of fake, as it were, um, pipeline 
of technology creation. Okay. So we can think about it as you start by identifying a problem, you then design, you understand the constraints that are relevant to the creation of the technology or the creation of the content, right? You come up with the cool idea, even if you don't yet know exactly how it's going to manifest. You develop it, again, the part that, that most people jump to, the part about actually building the thing, actually creating the meme. Um, then there's deployment, where it goes out into the world. There's use, where it doesn't just sit statically, but is in fact used by, perhaps used in the cognition of people who perceive it, perhaps used if it's technology to actually uh, create more things. And then, in many cases, it gets refined. I think one of the things that has become uh, really clear in the space of online harmful speech is exactly the ways in which the content is continually refined as people find better ways to get their message across. They, they find out different messages. They go back to the design phase and say, we need to reconsider this message. It's not getting through. Or they rethink deployment. They say, boy, we didn't get in front of the right audience. Let's try and get it in front of the, the right audiences, these other audiences instead. Now, Notice that although we're focused here in the Institute primarily on um, harmful speech, all of this is true of, of good speech as well, leaving aside the question of exactly how we distinguish good speech. Um, but <clears throat> we have the ability to think through this sort of quasi pipeline. It's not a unidirectional pipeline. This is obviously a caricature, but we can think about the ethical questions that arise at every single one of these six steps. And I've put them here. Uh, I'm sure most of you have already sort of skimmed them or looked over them as, as we're, you know, as I'm talking here. But what's important is that in all six of these uh, steps, there are these and many more questions that arise that are fundamentally ethical questions. They might have some techni technological implications or financial connections, but they are at core questions about our values, questions about the things that matter to us things about how we should act given whatever it is that we value. I mean, just look at design. Design is in many ways about how do we creatively uh, find solutions to multiple conflicting constraints. But in that sense, design is at least a very close cousin to, if not bordering on uh, closely shared with ethics because it's about values that might come into conflict Design is about constraints that may come into conflict. Now, values and constraints are not exactly the same, but they are closely related. And so we can see throughout this pipeline that ethical issues show up everywhere. Okay, so um, hopefully I've, I've convinced you, perhaps at the, the risk of having belabored things, that ethics is not about following, it's not about mere compliance. It's not about being sort of the, the police officer who comes in and says, no, no, you can't do that. It's not something that happens at the very end, like if you were, you know, that's sort of comparable to commenting your code where you build everything and then you go, you create the content, and then you go, oh yeah, maybe I should think about the ethical issues. Rather, ethical issues are arising everywhere. Next slide. Which is to say somewhat differently, next slide, you cannot avoid ethics at all of the stages along the way. And because we can't avoid it, it means that we should in fact embrace that many of our decisions are based in our values and will advance and promote certain values and perhaps not others. I often find when I'm talking to folks who operate in these spaces that there can be a kind of hesitation to commit to certain values or a kind of aversion to ethical decisions or ethical considerations. And I, I understand where that comes from, I think, in many ways. Um, but the challenge is that people are already making ethical decisions in the construction of particular kinds of content. They may not realize it. They may not be normally thinking in that way. But nonetheless, they're already making value-based ethical decisions. So rather than pretending that we're not, I want to encourage you to embrace that, to say, okay, we need to, as it were, lean in to the ethical nature of the decisions that we have to make. And we need to push forward and be explicit and open about how we're making those decisions. So how might we be able to do this kind of thing? Well, next slide. The first thing to recognize is, and this is 
this should be seem like a very simplistic point, but it nonetheless is, is worth making, that the ethical status, for example, of some piece of content online depends on intent, context, outcome, speaker, so many other things. So as a one you know, incredibly simple example, um, just consider the content, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. Now that content, if delivered from a white supremacist to a black individual with the intent of intimidation is clearly unethical. That content delivered from an individual to their sibling in advance of a basketball game the next day is almost surely ethical. It's clearly metaphorical. It's not intended to intimidate in any particular way. It's often depending on the history that may exist between those individuals, simply good natured fun, that that's the way, the language that they've together evolved to using. Professor, we have a yes. question. Sure. Uh, so this was for your earlier point. Uh, ah. Why do you think people have an aversion to thinking about ethics in tech? Um, so I think that it's, uh, I think it's a couple of reasons, and I'm going to talk about uh, one of the big ones on the next slide. Um, the big one, that I think, is in many cases that people uh, look and think to themselves, but I'm not trained in how to do this. Um, and so they think that they, you know, they, they look and say, that's, that's not what I'm trained for, so I shouldn't go down that road. Uh, it would be like, um, you know, a philosopher who has had no training in computer science thinking that, that they, they could just learn to code. I think most people have a, a measure of epistemic humility where they say, I don't know what I'm doing. And so I'm not entirely sure how to, you know, and so I, I'm just going to avoid asking those questions in the first place. Now, I don't think that that's the right thing to do. And I'll talk on the next slide about what we can do instead. I think another reason that people shy away from it is because they, um, I think it's it, another reason is because there's this belief that if I'm making an ethical decision, then I engage, I'm engaged in a kind of value imperialism, right? That if I make an ethical decision in the design of my technology, that in some sense, what I'm doing is I am imposing my values on others. And I really shouldn't do that. And so I should try to develop in a way that doesn't impose my values on others. I think that actually though betrays a kind of um, lack of understanding or appreciation for the depths uh, the, the ways in which values show up very deeply in the technology, whether you want it to or not. I mean, I, I appreciate and endorse uh, the aversion to value imperialism, to say, you know what, I shouldn't be dogmatically imposing my values on other people. I completely agree with that. That's a, it's a, a laudable instinct and response to the situation. The problem is that the the development of technology inevitably involves the prioritization of some values over others. And so if, you're, if you don't want to engage in value imperialism, then the real key is to go out and talk to the people on whom these values will be, as it were, imposed. Because it's not imposition if it's their values. Right? So if I talk to the relevant communities and find out here's what matters to them, then I will be in a position that it won't be imperialism because I'm not imposing my values. Rather, I'm helping them to realize the values and interests that are important to them. So what we need to do, and actually this fits beautifully with the next slide, is when we want to think about ethics, we want to make ethical decisions, we want to do ethical analyses, then next slide, what we need to do is we need to consider the moral interests and values of the relevant individuals and groups. Okay, so we need to avoid thinking that we know what other people want and care about. Sometimes we do, but a lot of times we don't. A lot of times we are in a position where uh, we are making a guess or we're thinking, oh, other people are like me. And this is where, I mean, to, think, to talk more broadly about technology development, this is, I think, uh, the core problem with um, so much technology being built to solve the problems of a very narrow slice of people is uh, is the developers not necessarily recognizing that other people's values and interests are not necessarily the same as theirs. Um, 
to use a simple, you know, and of, of course this gets, I should be clear, a very complicated. So let me give an example that's not about uh, harmful speech online. Um, and that is to think about loan approvals. And if so, if you ask people, you know, which, which is better, you know, which, sorry, let me say that. If you ask people, which one would you rather have? You are incorrectly turned down for a loan that you would have been approved for, what we would call a false negative, right? You're told, no, you don't get a loan, even though you could have paid for it. Or we give you a loan, even though you aren't necessarily able to repay it, a false positive. If you ask people, which one do they think is worse? Like, which one would they rather have us minimize? Most people will say um, a false negative is worse. Denying someone access to credit when they were able to use that credit and repay, that's worse than giving credit to people who aren't necessarily going to be able to repay it. And I think that that response that people have is based in a certain amount on a kind of generosity, right? We, we'd rather err on the side of giving people the chance than err on the side of denying them opportunities. Um, I think it also comes from a kind of optimism that many people have. I may not be able to repay it right now, but I'm going to be able to do better. Things will get better. It turns out, if you just look at the data, though, that false positives are far worse for people than false negatives. So our perceptions are, or our naive perceptions, are wrong. It's far worse to give someone credit when they are not, according to our best guess, able to repay than it is to deny them access. Because if you deny them access to credit, they can probably go and find it somewhere else if they actually are a good credit risk. If you give them a loan when they are not able to, you can put them into a spiral whereby they will lose the limited financial security that they already have. So it's actually better to err on the other side, even though people will tell on the false negative side, rather than people will tell you that you should err on the false positive side. So that's an example where it gets very complicated to figure out what are the values that are relevant for the particular case that we're looking at. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in some coming slides about what some of these values might be when we're thinking specifically about the context of harmful speech online. But it's important to realize that if we want to understand how to think through ethically what we ought to do in this space, we need to not simply assume that we know what people want and value, but rather actually engage with them. Now, doing this, next slide, obviously has a kind of giant looming risk, which is you turn into, uh, you go down the road where for anything you want to do, any decision you want to make, uh, it ends up requiring weeks and weeks of just awful ethical analyses. And I want to be really clear from the at this point when we think about our ethical obligations i think almost it is very very rare that our obligation is to conduct a five week ethical analysis of the question that that is in front of us at that moment i think it is very rarely the case that we actually have to do massive massive amounts of ethical analysis i think more typically what we should be looking for are heuristics. We should be looking for, uh, defeasible here just means a heuristic that might be wrong, that we might go, ah, normally this is the right thing to do, but, but this is a special case, so I'm not gonna worry about it here. Or sort of rules of thumb, what we ought to do as a default, but we allow for the possibility that specific situations might not fit the heuristic or the rule of thumb. And this is, I would suggest, actually the way many of us live our lives, right? All else being equal, no, don't speak. All else being equal, be nice, you know, don't lie. But we all recognize, or at least usually recognize, that in ethic, that when we're doing ethical decision making, those are, while good heuristics are rules of thumb, those are not perfect. There are conditions where the right thing to do might require that I not tell the whole truth in some sense. Or as we noted earlier, that to, to do, to, to drive safely might require in a moment that I do a little bit of speed. So we need to develop, when we think about our ethical obligations, 
the ethical obligation is to develop useful guidance in the form of defeasible heuristics that can be used by the humans making these kinds of ethical decisions. Now, next slide. Um, uh, the, this is a case where, um, you know, next slide. Uh, as I already said, this is this, you know, the thing I already touched on, which is I do think that a lot of people would say, well, wait a second, I wasn't trained in how to do this ethics stuff, so what do I do? Um, and the first point is the one I've already made, next slide, that um, you need to recognize that you're already making ethical decisions. So if I'm going to use, um, you know, one of the many tools that you've been learning how to use over the course of the Summer Institute. If I'm going to use one of those tools to understand the bot network that is amplifying a particular piece of harmful disinformation,